Hello, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Mohammed Ahmedullah. I'm the Secretary of Ritland Circle. And thank you for coming to uh, this session tonight. Um, I'll just say a little bit about uh, Ritland Circle and Bengal History Week, and then I'll pass on to Roger for a nice discussion on the history of the company. Um, Ritland Circle, you know, it emerged from um, many of us sitting in cafes and talking politics you know, in Ritland and in the street maybe in the 1990s. It sort of emerged, um, how do you say this, organic. Right? Um, we used to talk about politics uh, to do with Bangladesh. And on Sunday, uh, Friday issues of uh, newspapers used to arrive by plane from Bangladesh. So we used to pick up the papers and read, you know, development. For those days, didn't have internet newspapers, didn't you know what was going on, we had to wait. Uh, so we used to discuss politics and many of us were very interested in developments in Bangladesh. Anyway, so we decided uh, to have informal gathering once a month and discuss some of the issues that we see, you know, coming from the Bangladesh newspapers. Anyway, so we did that for informally for a couple of years, then we got bored, and then we stopped. And then in 2007, we kind of formally started, we set up a company named by guarantee. And since then, we have been uh, doing a lot of activities. It's all documented on our website, well, many of the things that we've done. Um, um, yes, and the Bengal History Week, it emerged from uh, this book, publication of this book, actually. In 2007, it was the 250th anniversary of the Battle of Classic, uh, you know, when the British took over Bengal. Um, so we applied for some funding, you know, from the Heritage Lottery Fund to run a project called uh, Battle of Classic Young People's Project. We wanted to get some young people engaged you know, who would do something, who would undertake research on uh, East India Company in London, sites, various sites, and then write a book. Uh, so this is a book called Plus's Legacy. It was published in 2010, and we a big, big book launch at the uh, uh, Museum of London in Docklands. Um, we had lots of young people joining, but they soon realized it was quite challenging, so you know, we lost quite a few, quite quickly. But uh, many stayed and eight completed. And when this book was uh, finished, one of the girls said, you know, we learned so much, why don't we continue? And she suggested we have Bengal History Week. So we started 2010, and this is the sixth annual Bengal History Week. Um, why uh, we also interested in history? Because then, like growing up here, we didn't know much about our history. Um, and so we are made, having to make uh, personal uh, efforts, you know, and, and we discussed. Um, but within the Bangladeshi community, you know, there's a strong uh, sense of history, but not factual history. There's a lot of politicized history. And politicized history <coughs> can be quite dangerous as well because you know, people take positions and then they use history to justify or whatever. Right? So history, you know, learning history can be liberating, but it can be oppressive, <coughs> it can be uniting, it can be divisive. Right? So what we are interested in is uh, we don't choose you know, what subject to cover. We try to find people who are doing research. We encourage people to do research and the share, and then you know um, provide examples, you know, and show archives. You know, take people to archives or sources, sources of information, so that if more people become familiar with um, with the sources of information, and we we introduce this or we encourage in you know, a critical sort of thinking and 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 a desire for objective learning of history, then I think we will have more people know more ab about sources and, and more independent interpretation, then we have less uh, uh, possibility of people using history for negative purposes. To okay, them. very good. Thanks. Um, the uh, subject of these Evening's meeting is where is the uh, what's ever happened to the East India Company because it was in its day it was huge it had it um, it had a monopoly of trade east of South Africa um, it went on for 250 years it was deemed too big to fail it, it had more than half the world shipping it had a standing army of 
more than 250,000. Um, so if you walk around London now, you might expect to see something that remains of it because the city itself has, it's been one of its build, building blocks, one of its, um, uh, fine, it's, it's, the city has grown, helped to grow because of the company. So um, I'm just going to start by thinking not uh, where is the company, but, but uh, in fact where, where was the company? And if I can click this. Um, so here's the old Roman wall that defines the city of London, the financial city, uh, which still has its own uh, governance and its own police force. Um, and the southeast corner of this city, which today is full of the big high-rise uh, blocks that are the iconic um, buildings, uh, are all in a cluster down this area, which is exactly the same area that the uh, East India Company operated out of. Now, ships would come up to London, this is the nearest you can get to the uh, sea. So they would stop here uh, at the legal quays near, around Custom House to uh, discharge their cargoes. Um, and the cargoes would then infiltrate up into the, uh, into the city and around England. Um, the company itself started underneath the walkie-talkie, the big uh, uh, building there. It was, uh, that was the, where the house of Sir Thomas Smythe was. It was a big hall house. He was um, a merchant and a, a, an entrepreneur. His grandfather had founded the uh, Muscovy Company about 50 years earlier. His father um, had founded the uh, Levant Company, dealing with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and Sir Thomas Smythe himself would go on to found uh, the, or be involved in the Virginia Company in America. And his house there was just full of people coming and going, of captains, of ideas, of navigators coming. Um, bringing bits from all around the world. There was an Inuit uh, canoe and hanging from the roof, and there were all um, and people would stay the night there and uh, tell their tales. Uh, Sir Thomas Smythe was a member of the Skinners Company. Everybody who worked in the, in the city had to be a member of the company. Everybody who traded or carried on any uh, any business, he was a member of the Skinners Company. As was uh, Sir James Lancaster, who was the captain of the first uh, fleet to go to. Uh, America uh, to uh, sorry to Asia under the uh, uh, East, new East India Company, which was founded in 1600. They both grew so rich that the uh, trust funds that they um, that they started are still in use, and they fund charitable works today. Sir Thomas Smythe's charitable fund and Lancaster as well, funding schools, funding uh, good works, funding independent uh, arms houses and independent. Uh, uh, individuals for uh, education. Um, so th the company then uh, moved up, uh, after the death of uh, Smythe, the company moved up to a place called Crosby Hall uh, and eventually into India, East India House, uh, which was um, uh, a mansion to begin with. They initially, their um, goods and cargoes were distributed in warehouses around here in Little, around Leadenhall Market, the Royal Exchange. Uh, but eventually, they built their own warehouses up here, Cutler Street warehouses, um, seven acres in about uh, 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 the end of the 18th century. And they built the commercial road down to their East India docks uh, so uh, uh, goods could come into the city, into here, into their uh, bonded warehouses, so they didn't have to go through the customs house, and that would cut down on all the pilfering that went on and uh, keep it fairly tidy. Uh, so just to move into now into the um, what was there at East India House. No, oh, sorry, this is Cutler. This is Cutler Street, um, as it is today. Um, it's a, it's it's it was. Uh, it was taken over by the PLA after the Port of London Authority after uh, after the demise of the company in 1857, uh, when the company was forced out of business by the um, terrible way they handled the Indian Mutiny. Um, Margaret Makepeace, who's the lead curator at the East India Company Records at British Library, um, says that um, she had a glimpse of the past when she visited the old Bengal warehouse, which is part of this structure, um, in 2003. Um, and she said, the East India Company warehouse in London was 
in something very close to its original state. It was built in the mid-18th century to store muslins, calicos, raw and raw silks, and shawls shipped to London from Bengal. Work was about to begin to convert it for residential and retail use. I was able to stand in the empty warehouse rooms and imagine what it was like when they were filled with bales of cloth and laborers busy, busy about their work. Fireproof metal doors with large bolts separated the floors into large compartments with low ceilings broken up only by columns to help lead load bearing. I was one of the last outsiders to gain access before modernization. Well, today, if you go in there, you, you'll be completely unaware that East India Company had anything to do with this. Uh, there's very little to see that, uh, uh, that it was associated with the company. And it is the last great uh, Georgian warehouse complex in London. Um, the East India House itself, in Leadenhall Street, uh, had a... Uh, uh, used to be in where Lloyd's now is, uh, this iconic building of modern London. Um, and if you want, and this is a listed building, but if you wander around here, there's no sign, there's nothing to tell you that the East India, uh, East India house was there. That's what it looked like. It had a 200 metre front. It had this wonderful sort of neoclassical uh, in, in empire uh, building, Britannia on the top, bits of empire there. And Around 4,000 people were employed by the company in London. It was reckoned around 20,000 people nationwide relied on the company one way or another. In here, uh, there were the courtrooms for the directors, handsome rooms hanging with pictures of the, of the places in the, uh, were their forts around uh, India and, and Asia, uh, and statues and grand staircases. And there was a big sale room where all the cargoes were, were sold off. Uh, at auctions, uh, which was described as like a bear pit, because I think it was they were fairly rowdy. The, um, they also had a big library here, um, not surprisingly, um, and um, a, a large museum as well, which started to gather in people coming from the east, used to bring in uh, all their souvenirs and so forth. Uh, and uh, what half a dozen years before they closed, the um, great exhibition was held in Hyde Park and the East India Company was one of the main uh, exhibitors there um, and it gave, the, gave people a sort of taste for wanting to see what was on around the world um, and in the last two years of the company there were 100,000 people a year visiting the museum in, in Leadenhall Street now one of the um, one of the sort of great uh, souvenirs from, uh, from the East India Company was Tipu's Tiger, which you may have seen in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, the, uh, Tipu Sultan, the Sultan of Mysore, um, uh, lost, his, lost his life and lost his uh, empire uh, in 1799 when Seringapatam, his, uh, uh, his uh, palace and fort, was taken. He had a great penchant for tigers. This, if you wind it up here, uh, the tiger growls and the East India Company uh, officer screams and shouts. And <laughs> so everybody uh, enjoyed that. And that was at the uh, East India Company house, uh, East India House, and it was at the um, Crystal Palace as well. Um, so when the company folded, there was an awful lot of stuff they had to get rid of one way or another, and they had to go in, and it went in various directions. Um, the South Kensington Museum took 20,000 items, um, and they had, it took, a, it took two curators two years to index those 20,000 items from the museum, and, you can, and they've still got the volumes in, uh, in South Kensington now. Um, the, there was a brief, brief interregnum when the money from the Crystal Palace was spent on all the museums at South Kensington. That's how they got built. Um, uh, in between time, there was this Imperial Institute that was built in Exhibition Road where there was a big... Mo a lot of the India stuff went. There were about a dozen galleries there. Um, but that didn't survive the 50s when the uh, Imperial College wanted to expand... Uh, and so it sort of uh, took up all that space and everything went back to the V&A. Um, now, 
the first person really to get excited about the end of um, uh, the end of uh, the East India House uh, was um, uh, it was somebody from Kew Gardens, uh, and that was Joseph Hooker, and he came. He was the director of Kew Gardens, and he came rushing up. And he got cartloads of things to take back to Kew. So he got rice samples, he got wood samples, he got all sorts of plant samples. Kew is kind of uh, Kew is pretty important in terms of um, the East India Company because since its inception by Joseph Banks, who was the botanist on uh, Captain Cook's ships, um, it had been sourcing plants from around the world um, and. Um, he himself, um, uh, Joseph Hooker, who'd, who'd got the stuff from, uh, from East India House, had, had visited Bengal and the Himalayas and was a plant collector also. Uh, and his father uh, started the Herbarium and Museum of Economic Botany uh, at, uh, uh, at Kew. Uh, I think there's a talk coming up too uh, on, on, on Monday on, on the gardens and, and the garden in Calcutta, which is uh, seminal really to this because uh, the gardens the uh, botanic garden in Calcutta um, uh, provided a lot of the uh, plants uh, particularly under um, uh, Roxburgh William Roxburgh uh, who produced two and a half thousand illustrations of plants and they're still in Calcutta but the copies were being sent uh, to Kew uh, and he was uh, followed in, in post by uh, Nathaniel Wallach, who, uh, who, who, who's, who sent thousands of plants to Kew, um, and the Wallach collection at Kew uh, is actually officially called the Honourable East in India Company collection. Uh, it's the largest herbarium in Kew. I don't know if you know what a herbarium is, but it's just when they squash plants together uh, between <coughs> bits of paper uh, and keep them, or well, bits of linen really, so the acid doesn't get on them. Um, and uh, the, the East India Company name has been lost really from, from the collection. It's now just called the, the Wallach Collection. Um, I'm jumping backwards and forwards a bit, but Joseph Hooker's father also started um, what he called... Um, The Museum of Economic Botany, and that's still there. It's called Museum Number no. One at uh, Kew, and you can see some lots of curiosities. It basically, it shows how all the material from the empire or from the East India Company's empire um, helped uh, its products help the economy and move the economy on. This is an indigo factory from Bengal. Um, and that was uh, exhibited in the Colonial and Indian Exhibition in 1886. But again, it's collected in this, in this uh, museum. Um, uh, the British Library obviously took a load of books, and I don't know if you'll, some of you will be familiar with this room, which is the Asia and Africa Studies Reading Room. These paintings come from the East India House. That's Used to, that coat of arms used to be in the uh, director's courtroom um, and it was sold off for seven shillings and sixpence when the company closed. Um, so the um, British Library, when it relocated to Euston, managed to um, get all the um, written material on site. So there's about 11 kilometers of shelving or whatever they say of East India Company material and uh, comp uh, material from other, other uh, from uh, Burma and other parts of the East. Um, and when it, in, shortly after it opened, it um, had, a, had a, a, a kind of uh, exhibition there as well for, for the British East India Company. Um, I can move that on. So when the company closed, it was taken over by the British government, the British Raj, and India House was built uh, in the Foreign Office, was in what is now the Foreign Office. Uh, this is the Durbar Court, 
the handsome Durbar Court built by a, um, the uh, architect of the East India Company. And up on the, up the meeting rooms for the East India House are just up on the top left here. And in those meeting rooms, you can see some bits from East India House. There are some bits of the, there are some uh, doors there and some panelling. And there's a clock that shows the time both in Delhi and London and... Um, and a few paintings and the director's chair. Uh, the Durbar Court is open one day uh, on open house day and it's worth a visit. The whole foreign office is worth a visit. Uh, if you've not been, it's a handsome, handsome place. Um, outside uh, the India office is this statue of Clive of India, which you may be familiar with. That's the India office there. That's the Treasury, that's Whitehall at the back, that's St James's behind us, and the Buckingham Palace. Um, around the plinth at the bottom are uh, little reliefs about Plassey and Arcot. Um, but there's nothing, no mention of the East India Company. It's just, uh, it's just Clive. Uh, when Clive died, um, Sir William Forward... He, Clive was buried in Shropshire at Morton Say, where, his, where he had been born, and he bought the property there as well. If you want to know about Clive, uh, the Brick Lane Circle has got a great, uh, on its website, has got a great thing about it. It shows you all the property that he bought. He was the richest man in England by everybody's account. He had been tried for uh, peculation and corruption, uh, but he'd got off. Um, uh, he, it, subsequent to the Battle of Plassey, he'd, uh, um, he'd, he'd just gone into the vaults, of the, the, the royal vaults, and he, was a, he said that he was allowed his choice of whatever he could, he could have there. But he did uh, declare that he was... He said to Parliament, My God, is it, I'm, I'm astonished at my own moderation in not picking up half, this, half these trinkets. So he was rich, he bought um, uh, property. All these East India Company men like Clive who were looked down on by uh, the aristocracy because they were just mere tradesmen and merchants and things. Uh, their great wish was always to buy a pile, to, to buy an estate so they'd become, they'd become landed gentry and uh, preferably to buy a, a seat in Parliament as well because they liked to, um, the company liked to have uh, good few people in Parliament who were on their side. Uh, he be did become an MP. Um, so he looks as though he's part of the furniture, really, of empire. He was died, he died and was buried, as I say, up in, in Shropshire. 133 years after he died, somebody called Sir William Forward, uh, whose grandfather had buried him, went up to the church to find out about him. Um, and to see what was there. I think Sir William Ford was a Liverpool merchant. I don't know too much about him. Uh, but his grandfather had been the vicar uh, at the time of Clive's death. Um, he could find no sign of Clive or his tomb. All he could find was a little plaque that was barely legible. So in, uh, out of curiosity, he then came down to London and went to Westminster Abbey, where the good and the great are all celebrated with great plaques and huge sculptures and lots of angels and weeping damsels um, and there was no sign of Clive there either so he then went to Calcutta and he could find no sign of Clive there either in the streets or there's no um, there's not no so from Calcutta from the Grand Hotel he wrote to the Times and said that he couldn't understand why such a great man as Clive had never been honoured in England well this was uh, 1906, it was taken up by um, Lord Curzon, who was the um, viceroy in India, who got excited about it and they raised some money, and the result is this statue. So for all that time, Clive had been completely absent from the public view in England, and they also put a plaque up in, uh, in Westminster Abbey. Um, I just want to... The, the other great figure of empire is Warren Hastings. Oh, that's Clive's, that's just um, Barclay Square, because I couldn't get a picture, because he 
they've got scaffolding up so I just thought of his house at number 50, uh, 45 where he died he overdosed on laudanum uh, people still like to try and work out why he died but I think he was in great pain and uh, just took too much the doctor who had attended him said if he takes any more laudanum tonight he's, he'll, go, he'll kill himself and he did take more laudanum <coughs> Warren Hastings this is a statue of him in the Durbar court there are Durbar courts sort of surrounded by figures like that that's the only statue of him in London um, when he when he um, when he died somebody called Richard Westmacott ten years afterwards made a big statue to him and showed it at the Royal Academy but nobody wanted to do anything with it nobody would take it so they shipped it off to Calcutta and it's still in Calcutta it's outside the uh, Victoria Memorial Hall um, but um Warren Hastings himself had a fairly comfortable retirement. He was impeached uh, again for corruption, had a seven-year trial, which went on and on and bored the nation, but he was found okay in the end. And he retired to um, an estate that his family had earned, uh, owned a few generations beforehand, um, and he had vowed to get back. They'd lost it during the Civil War. Uh, and he made enough money uh, through uh, in India to as the first Governor General of India uh, to buy back the estate which is called Dalesford's, it's in Gloucestershire um, and if I can do this there it is um, you can see he had this sort of mogul style additions put on for him uh, and it's a handsome place in many acres um, and it's had quite an interesting history it was um, more latterly owned by um, Lord Rothermere uh, after the war who used to entertain there the press baron uh, and then it was owned by Baron Tyson Bonamitza and he's, he, who married his wife Tito the Spanish wife here uh, and he of course has they of course set up the um, uh, 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 Tyson Bonamitza gallery in, in Madrid the current incumbents are his Lord Bamford uh, of JCB, they make mechanical diggers and things like that. Um, and Lady Bamford has taken it on herself to uh, do a bit of farming, and she runs a farm shop. Um, it's a fiddle, this. Uh, called Dalesford's. Uh, it's a smart place. You can buy a lemon there for six quid. Uh, <laughs> that's in Pimlico. That's the ones in Marylebone. Uh, and there's one in Notting Hill, uh, and they're sort of they're spreading. So if you see the Dalesford sign, you know it's Warren Hastings, um, and it's the um, uh, it's Warren Hastings' uh, ill-gotten gains from the uh, governorship of India that uh, brought it here. Um, Sir Stanford Raffles hasn't got anything to do with Bengal, but he's certainly got a lot to do with the East India Company. Uh, these two tigers were born last year in London Zoo and they're Sumatra tigers. Uh, Sir Stanford Raffles himself brought a tiger back with him from uh, Sumatra on his last trip. Well, second, his, his last trip. His second to last trip was a disaster. He lost the whole ship with everybody on it and his entire, what he calls his entire Noah's Ark. Sir Stanford Raffles founded the London Zoo um, and it's down to his energies and efforts largely that the zoo was founded. Um, and... Uh, Again, his, it's hard to find any, any memory, any place of you know, where he is. It's hard to see him, it's hard to, there are no, no, no statues to him, anything. He founded, he founded Singapore, which was rather important, uh, and there's the statues of him then. He, he, his idea was that um, Singapore is pretty important on the trade route, it's on the corner of South China Sea and, uh, and, and the Indian Ocean. Um, and he, he came back, he died within a year of returning, in fact. He bought a place called Highwood up in uh, Hendon. Um, and he again had this sort of strange ending because the vicar, who was called Theodore Williams, 
uh, refused to put up any plaque to him when he died because Theodore Williams' family was involved in the Jamaican slave trade and Raffles was an anti-slavery campaigner. Uh, and as a result, it wasn't until 1914 when they refurbished the church that uh, his, his, his grave was kind of rediscovered uh, and a plaque was put on his grave, uh, which is still there, but it is, you can't really see it. It's on the floor by, um, by the chancellor and it's, if you, um, it's got a sort of bit of plastic on top of it and you can't really read it. Um, but again, it doesn't say that he belonged to the East India Company, as with Clive. Uh, Warren Hastings, uh, on the other hand, his, his very loyal wife, uh, at her own expense, put a plaque up in Westminster Abbey. Um, and that does mention uh, his, uh, his, uh, his contribution to the East India Company. But otherwise, these men are not remembered anywhere for being East India Company people. They're just remembered for being British colonial people. <coughs> it, um, Ken Livingston said, there are two statues. He was, he was talking about the new statue they were going to put an artwork on. He said, he said who these guys are, I have not a clue. He said, he does, he, I suppose... There is not one person in 10,000 who walks through Trafalgar Square who knows who Sir Henry Havelock and Sir Charles James Napier were. Well, they were East India Company officers. You know who he was. <laughs> well, you're the one in 10,000. <laughs> um, the, um, the army did a bit better in terms of their memorials. They get uh, very lavish memorials in... Uh, uh, Westminster Abbey, and it's also best if you die abroad and you don't die in England, and then you tend to get a, a big, uh, uh, a big. Uh, uh, well, uh, have a look. I think died in Cornwall, didn't he? And died in the, uh, the uh, after he uh, died at Lucknow after he relieved the siege. Um, so w the other East India Company person, well, he wasn't a member of the East India Company, but uh, Arthur Wellesley. Uh, was certainly important. His brother Richard was the governor uh, of, of India uh, and he brought Arthur out and Arthur led a division in the siege of Serengapatam when Tipu Sultan was uh, brought down and he went and uh, took over uh, the palace there and organised the uh, prize money and, and, and so forth uh, at the end of it. But if you go to Apsley House where... Um, number one London where Wellesley well, uh, lived in fact Richard bought the house first but then he lived there um, you won't see, you'll see hardly anything to do with India it's all about the Peninsula Wars you can go there and you wouldn't know he'd been to India uh, there are a couple of uh, sabres from uh, Tipu Sultan in a, in a box full of lots of other swords uh, but otherwise it's, 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 all, uh, it's all Spain and Portugal The Tipu's legacy is extraordinary. This is a, a sale at Bonhams earlier this year, um, which raised several million pounds. It was mainly to do with um, a, a military museum that had just changed tack, really, in Stratford-upon-Avon. The guy who died, who used to run it, had had a, um, uh, a penchant for Indian militaria, so all this stuff came out. There was a cannon here and so forth. Um, but lots of things from Tipu Sultan's uh, palace come up from time to time. And in the last few years, when, when, when the, at the end of the siege, Wellesley insisted that his throne was broken up with a sledgehammer so it wasn't uh, used as some gathering point for his people who around him. So, and it was broken up. Um, and in the last few years, a couple of... Um, uh, tiger heads, golden tiger heads that are jewel encrusted have come up for auction and, and both have fetched around a quarter of a million pounds. Um, and so his stuff does come up with some, some regularity. These are biannual sales. There's his tent, the Tipu Sultan's tent. Uh, and that is currently at the Victoria and Albert Museum's uh, exhibition called Fab The Fabric of India, which is an excellent exhibition, highly recommended. Uh, I think it's never been put up before in its full extent. 
It, was, uh, it usually lives in Powys Castle in Wales, where the Clive Museum is, which I'll mention in a minute. Uh, and, but there it's only half shown, but here it's, it's shown its entirety. Uh, and it's on, I think, till January, the exhibition. That's Powys Castle, uh, which Clive's son Edward, he married into the Lord Powys' family, and it passed to the National Trust, I think, can't remember, not that long ago, uh, when the death duties were getting a bit out of hand. Uh, but it's now with the National Trust, and there's a Clive Museum there in Wales. Um, there are many a mansion around Britain that has um, the, oh, their background to the East India Company. This is Osterley House in West London in Chiswick. Um, it's regarded as the last... The last farm in London, the last country estate in London, and it's an extraordinary place because if you go there, it's got lovely Charolais cattle and it's got a good farm shop where you can buy cheap stuff, it's really good. Um, and this was the home of the Child family. The original Sir Francis Child uh, founded the Child's Bank, which is the oldest bank in London, uh, in 16 or 1646, I think, something like that. Um, and I think it's part of the Royal Bank of Scotland now. Uh, and I think it's still got its headquarters in number one Fleet Street. There were three generations of child. He was a, um, a, he was a, a goldsmith, the original one. He was a goldsmith to William III, um, and uh, he benefited from the, um, the diamond industry at Golconda in India, uh, which would have given him a good source of, uh, uh, for his uh, goldsmithing. Um, on the other side of London, uh, there's another child family. It's rather sort of strange. Uh, but these other chi oh, children, uh, these, the, all three generations were uh, directors of the company as well. Um, this is Wanstead House that belonged to Sir Josiah Child, who was known as the despot of Leadenhall Street. Uh, he, was a you know, he was the governor of the, of the East India Company. Um, it was laid out like Versailles. Um, there's a little house down there, not so little. And there's the fantastic um, uh, grounds there. Um, he was... Uh, even though he built all this stuff, he was still looked down on by the, by the sort of upper-class people. And uh, John Evelyn, the diarist, said that... Uh, uh, described child as making fish ponds many miles in circuit in Epping Forest in a barren spot as commonly these overgrown and suddenly moneyed men for the most part seek themselves. He from an ordinary merchant's apprentice and management of the East India Company's common stock being arrived to an estate of tis said £200,000. This merchant is most sordidly avaricious. <laughs> so they didn't, they didn't like these upstarts, these, these nouveau riche uh, that, that it didn't last the house a few generations later um, a daughter who was the richest non-royal in England married a nephew of the Duke of Wellington's and he was a, a no good soul who blew the lot uh, hang on I can't I've lost me cursor oh there it is can I scroll down doing that oh I can that's easier uh, so this is if you go to Epping Forest now to Wanstead, uh, Wanstead Park, Wanstead Park takes up half the estate and the golf course takes up the other half of the estate. So it's a pretty big, pretty big area you have there. Oh, this is good. Um, these are, this is a map of all the, all the places around London. I don't, probably won't go through them all now, but just um, to show how these, how they were spread around, the, uh, around here. Um, just mention a couple of things. Uh, Hatfield Castle um, uh, was where it, that turned into the East India, East India Company's College at Haleybury, um, which is an extraordinary place. The, it was built by Wilkinson, who built the National Gallery, and the, the main building looks like the National Gallery, and the whole place is as big as the town. Um, it became the Imperial Services College, uh, and it's today it's, it's just a it's just a private private school. It's enormous. Um, down here is the Addiscombe, uh, at Addiscombe is the East India Company military ceremony, their ceremony just outside Croydon and you wouldn't know the East India Company had been there at all except some of the roads are called uh, after some of the generals. 
Um, one other person to mention is out here um, at Swallowfield, Stratford Hayes, Wellington's country place. Uh, oh, Dial House is um, um, Twinings, the uh, tea people. Uh, that was their house. It's become, a, it's become a vicarage now. It belongs to the Bishop of Kingston. Um, Swallowfields down here belonged to Thomas Pitt, uh, who was known as Diamond Pitt. And he was a great diamond uh, merchant. Uh, and in fact, he was uh, dealing in diamonds illegally as far as the company was concerned because he wasn't doing it through the company and they fined him a lot of money. But he ended up working for the company because he knew so much. He bought what was called a rotten borough, um, uh, which, is, which is a, a, a parliamentary seat that actually had no people in it, rather importantly. Um, so he was able to elect himself as MP. Uh, and of course, uh, his son was William Pitt, who was Prime Minister, uh, who also sat at this uh, uh, parliamentary seat that had no, no people. And his son uh, was William Pitt Jr., I mean, who was the, William Pitt the Younger. So William Pitt, with his Golconda diamonds, founded the Prime Minister's dynasty of England. Um, yeah, so anyway, we can... Uh, oh, just one thing, Woburn Abbey up there. Uh, lots of plants came back from India, as I've mentioned. Uh, the Duke of uh, Devonshire was a great plant collector, and at um, Chis uh, Chiswick House a couple of years ago, they redid their um, uh, Camellia House. It's a beautiful uh, conservatory, uh, and they went back and they traced all the camellias they got there. And as a result, several of them are now named after the ship's captains of the East Indiamen who bought these particular camellias to England. I'm not sure where we're going now. Oh, yes. Uh, I just want to talk about... I've talked about how you kind of can't see the people. i talked about where the thing was. And now I want to talk about this is the effect of the products that came here have had on us. Uh, because of the culture of England, because, uh, you know, whether we know it or not. Uh, this, is, this is, in fact, Sir, uh, Sir James Lancaster. That's a picture of him in the uh, Skinner's Hall. There's another one in the National Maritime Museum that looks pretty similar. Uh, the reason he went, or the first ships went to India, was for pepper and spices. And pepper has always been valuable. Uh, it was valuable since Roman times. The 200 tonnes of pepper would pay for a... Uh, a legion of 6,000 soldiers for a year, keep them for a year. It's a, it's a very high-priced and very uh, valued commodity. And he did, uh, James Hank has, uh, did come back with pepper. Uh, if you go to... Uh, this is around East India Dock. This is the, this is the only remaining bit of... Um, I suppose any, anything kind of... Uh, that tells you anything about the docks. And this was actually the entrance to the pepper warehouse of the East India Company. This is the apothecary's sign here, because pepper, obviously all the spices are mixed up with medicine and with uh, uh, cures and herbalness, herbals. Um, so, spices were uh, uh, obviously uh, has changed our culinary. I mean, the, it's a whole another evening of talking about spices and what they did but they have changed our whole they changed the British diet uh, and they're responsible uh, for our cuisine to a large extent this is the first uh, Indian restaurant in London opened uh, by Sheikh Dean Mohammed in whenever it was 1810 um, it didn't survive he went off uh, he so in later life reinvented he came from Patna in Bengal uh, and he was brought over, he was, his father died, and he was brought over at the age of about 10 or 11 uh, by an East India Company officer, and uh, ended up in Ireland, and then came to London, set up here, um, and ended up in Brighton, um, reinventing himself as an East India Company surgeon, and being the, um, uh, what did he call himself, the shampoo... Uh, Shampoo surgeon to the king. So he was officially the shampoo surgeon. He, he brought the word shampoo to England as well because he started a, a spa nearby, uh, nearby Portman Square where, where this is. Um, we come to Charlie's bit of the world now. Uh, this is a silk dress. It was made for Anne Fanshawe in 1752. 
Uh, she was the daughter of the Lord Mayor. Her mother had died, so when the Lord Mayor uh, was sworn in and uh, had to go processing, uh, he took, his daughter was made, his daughter was called Lady Mayoress, and this was the dress that was rustled up for her in Spitalfields. Just south of here, there's a square called, it used to be the Tenter Estate, and I think it was the North Tenter, uh, Tenter, North Tenter Road, South Tenter Road, East Tenter Road. Just around, the, these were the Tenter grounds around here, just outside the city where, um, in the Middle Ages, they spread out their cloths and things to dry in the sun after they'd been dyed and so forth. Um, the Spitalfields, uh, you're probably familiar with this, um, these, w the weaving in Spitalfields, uh, owes itself, owes its life to the Huguenot population uh, who, uh, there were Protestants, there was a schism in the Catholic Church um, and the Protestants uh, went one way, the Catholics remained where they were. They, they were tolerated, the Protestants of Nero were, were tolerated in France until the king changed his mind, uh, at which point a lot of them fled. And around 13,000 came to England, most of them settling in London, um, and they brought with them their skills. Now they, um, silk was always, always since Roman times have been really popular, but very expensive. And the problem in England is you can't make silk in England. You can in France because they've got mulberry trees, uh, and so um, there was a huge, it, it, and it was so popular at court. Um, James the first sent out a. Uh, an edict to the sheriffs of every county in England that they should plant mulberry trees uh, uh, because that's where the, um, the silkworm will live on a mulberry tree. Um, and he also asked the uh, Virginia company to uproot all their tobacco and replace it with mulberry trees. All unsuccessful. He planted a, a big um, orchard of mulberry trees at the back of... Um, uh, back of the palace, the back of St. James's Palace, uh, and there's one mulberry tree that still exists just in the corner of uh, High Park Corner. Um, but in 2000, 30 different mulberry trees were planted in uh, Buckingham Palace, and so now the Queen is now the holder of the National Mulberry, mulberry, mulberry Tree Collection. But all this is just to say that um, the only way they could get hold of raw silk was it came in on the East India Company ships. So that this whole industry is here because of the East India Company ships, to an extent. Um, there were East India Company also built, bought in pieces, but bought in uh, made cloth from India, which is fairly in, relatively inexpensive, and that led to uh, quite a few um, uh, sort of disruptions, really, or, or uh, in uh, some outbreaks of uh, by the weavers who thought they were being undercut. Um, uh, and uh, at one stage the, the th uh, several thousand people marched on Josiah's uh, child's house in Wanstead and they broke into East, East uh, the East India house uh, and they caused uh, uh, some trouble uh, around, around the city in Parliament um, I don't want to be too much longer because I think it's getting warm in here but uh, I just want to talk about um, well, sorry, I should just mention the Calico riots as well, which was when the Calico, um, uh, when, the, when the company acquired free trading rights in Bengal uh, and imports of dyed silk and calico trebled in about three years, in 1719 to 21, uh, for the first time, women in London uh, who were not well off uh, could wear bright cheerful, colourful clothes that were comfortable in cotton and not these sort of dowdy woolen things. Uh, and the weavers were outraged because it was undercutting their, 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 their work. So they, um, they were attacked, some of these women, their clothes were torn and nitric acid was even thrown at them sometimes. Uh, and it, it got pretty violent. Um, and the weavers' company itself employed... Um, uh, uh, they employed Daniel Defoe, the writer, to do their PR for them to uh, try and uh, protect them and, and get some protective laws through Parliament, which came and went a bit. Um, anyway, this is just to show that 
this is how this part of Spitalfields started to become used to textiles. Uh, the Jewish population then moved in with the rag trade that they were uh, involved in and good at. And now it's still, uh, in, in Bangladesh, it's still fashion and textiles are still really important. So the whole, the whole thing has had that kind of progression, really. <coughs> Um, I think on Sunday somebody, is it uh, George, Dr. Georgia Weems is giving me a talk about Docklands? No, she's not giving me a talk. Well, I mean, you're giving me a walk. walk yeah. Yes, and Docklands. So, if anybody... Uh, get it's really full, but it's for the future. Okay, okay. Um, I just want to talk uh, just briefly about how, um, how the company stretched London out into the East End. Uh, we've talked about here and the commercial road coming down to the East India docks here. The, the boats, you know, ships were first built at Deptford, then the company built, uh, owned docks at here because they didn't really want to go around this big loop because it could take them weeks just to get out of the Thames. And if they came back and had to then try and navigate this on a three masted ship, they could take days just getting around there. And also, uh, they would then unload stuff onto smaller ships, onto lighters to take them up here where it was a bit more crowded. Um, they didn't hold on to that dock for long, but they, uh, it became a dockyard building ships uh, until 1808 when they decided to build an actual an import and export dock. Um, but all that time they'd had a presence in Poplar. Um, St Matthias, that was their East India Chapel. It, that's the oldest building in East in, um, in the East End. Uh, it's now a community centre and you can see the, the, the pillars were made from some of the spars or some <laughs> from the ships and that's the very first um, emblem of the East India Company with three ships that James Lancaster returned with. Um, the, we just, the, all along that stretch of river there, all along the Tower Hamlets, just bit by bit became more and more busy and, and more full and uh, more horrible. Uh, and um, for Lascars coming from India, from uh, Lascars who were picked up in India because so many people died on the voyages to India that you probably, by the time you wanted to come back, you'd only got half your crew, so they try and uh, inveigle people in India to come back. Um, and Ayers, the women nurses uh, would uh, be employed as nannies for the children of the, of the families. Um, there's not a lot of evidence left of Lascars in, East, in London. The, there was a, uh, the company itself washed its hands of looking after them. It, uh, it, it, the way it worked was the company didn't actually own the ships. The company didn't run the fleets, but it did have overall control. Uh, somebody called a husband or a husbandman would set up a voyage. He would buy the. Sh he would usually go in with usually sixteen other people. They'd all put in a sixteenth share, um, and uh, they would. It was up to them to kit the ship out to do everything. The company would just keep an eye on it. The company would appoint the captain, um, but it was the, it was the company's view that the care of the sailors was down to the husbands and not down to them. Well, not everybody agreed with that um, and in about 1813 uh, the company was forced to build uh, a house in, uh, uh, it's called the, the Home for Sailors and I um, can't remember. It's called the Strangers' Home for Asiatics, Africans and South Sea Islanders. And that was opened just before the company closed in 1856. So, um, the, uh, the, but the company wasn't the only uh, backer of it. The um, uh, money came from elsewhere as well. Um, the missionary aspect of the company really only took off after 1813 when something called the Pious Clause was introduced. The company had refused to take any missionaries to India um, because it said it wasn't their business to do so, although they did, take, they did have chaplains and they did build churches. Um, but the whole of the Victorian rather fundamentalist uh, religious attitude was 
part of the part of the native British attitude towards the Industrial Revolution, when conditions in England were so appalling that the missionaries started going among the poor people in England, and it was these missionaries who sort of then sort of ended up looking after the Laskers and Ayers. Um, so the Ayer House here started off with a, the London uh, City Mission started off looking uh, with a, an Ayer House uh, in the city um, near Guildhall. This is uh, their big uh, Ayer House. It's in 26 King Edwards Road in Hackney. You, there's nothing to tell you it's that at all. There's no plaques or anything. Hackney uh, itself has got a, a, quite a nice uh, museum at the library, and it's got a corner all about the Ayers of, uh, who came here. Um, so just to whistle, that's, that's part of the dock wall that's left in East India House, uh, which is now the inside of it is East India Estate, about seven acres of, um, of modern uh, luxury, luxury, I don't know, uh, business, uh, thing. They're built, this is just hard by Canary Wharf and just, just on the edge of it they're building this huge computer farm for, I can't remember, it's called Telephone or something uh, so all the computer information is going to go through this huge block there um, and that's the basin that's an entry into the East India Dock that still exists so that's opposite the dome I just want to end on two things. Uh, this is the Amsterdam. Uh, it's a replica of a ship built in 1748. It was rebuilt in 1990. She actually sunk in Hastings, just off Hastings, uh, on her maiden voyage. Uh, and that's sitting outside the Maritime Museum in, in Amsterdam. Uh, Amsterdam also has its original um, East India Company house, still intact. It's, used, it's a very handsome <coughs> Renaissance red brick building. It's used by the university in Amsterdam and it's got the uh, court, director's court um, uh, is still there and, and, and has been preserved. Um, in fact, you can see the anchor of the original Amsterdam in, um, in St. Catherine Docks because it fetched up there. And this is the Swedish ship Gothenburg, another uh, replica, full-scale replica. It came up the Thames in 2007. Uh, it's on her maiden voyage, she'd just been to China. The Swedish uh, East India Company was mainly interested in China. Um, and uh, again in Sweden, the East India Company headquarters is by the dockside. It's now a maritime museum. It's got a good museum of, uh, of, uh, of its uh, past. Um, so what I'm thinking is, you can see these in Amsterdam, you can see that, but you can't see anything in London. You can't see there's no, there are no big ships or no, there's no East India Company house. Um, that was all. So that's it. Thank you very much. There's no chairs, so you might as well just interact. Oh, yeah. I mean, if anybody's got questions, shout. Yeah. Did we somehow become ashamed? Of yes, I think so. I think, I think that's why it kind of disappeared. You know, the with people like Clive weren't around. You know, until the Empire got off again, and then I think you know after 1947, shame was even deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but but it, it's just start, I think it's just starting to to bubble up a bit again. That people's interest in the East India Company. I mean, I, when I started doing this project, which was about two years ago, I thought, oh, nobody's interested in this. And then bit by bit, I keep finding other people who've been doing research and so forth. But I remember reading something in some history book. It wasn't about the East India Company specifically, but it mentioned it. And the East India Company, I'm pretty sure, had exams on the ethics of working in a foreign country and how to do good things in a foreign country. Undoubtedly. I don't know if we have ethics for civil servants now, but they certainly did. Yes, they did, and they, they, they would have to sort of, um, you know, they'd be encouraged to learn Persian, and, you know, there was a whole cultural background, there, especially at the, um, uh, uh, at Haleybury, um, and they had some, uh, they had, well, one of the writers was John Stuart Mill, who was uh, a great liberal, uh, who worked as a writer all his life in the company. Um, and 
uh, Malthus, who, who invented the Malthusian population theory, he was a professor at the uh, uh, at the um, uh, uh, at the college. Um, yes, they were, and but it did change uh, in Warren Hastings' days. It, it did have a sort of it it did have an ambition mm. that was clearer. Uh, uh, it just really in Victorian times, it just from you know the earlyish in the 19th century, it just became the, and the Raj was just about money and yes. it was uh, fairly horrible. Well, that would link with them being called Nabobs and so on. It, it seems to me that it's, it is the psychology of excess that of course. didn't Well, yes, yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, it's having said that, you know, they were quite happy to get lots of diamonds and stick them in their crowns and, um, uh, yeah. Uh, I think, <coughs> mentioning Warren Hastings, yeah. um, who I think was quite rightly not impeached. Yes. Um, that, that was a campaign against him. But you know, he was a person of very lofty ideals and um, his... Um, he was the first governor general. Um, his exercise of that power was very enlightened. It seems to be out of um, his attitudes and the way he, he ran things. You you got you got the beginnings of the University of Calcutta, for example, because he was deeply committed to understanding Indian culture and um, encouraging the study of English Indian languages. Um, you know, and the skill with which the company um, ran India, it mustn't be. Um, you, it's, it's had this huge army. Yeah, yeah, no, it's. it's not... um, I'm, I'm interested in because I'm <coughs> Anglo-Indian in um, ethnic origin, and um, a lot of my ancestors went out with the company. I've been doing a lot of research um, through that and because of the excellence of their record keeping you can do a lot of research into um, Absolutely. What, yeah. what went on. So yeah. it's... No, I think there was... And, and they did um, leave um, an administrative structure um, which India still benefits from. So... Yeah. Yes, they, they were out there to make money, and they did, in, on, on occasions, act disgracefully, and they, by 1857, they had lost their way. Yeah. But, uh, you know, at the, the height of their mm. powers, it's, you know, they, they, mm. they, there was a lot to be admired in what they did. Mm. And could I just say at that point that uh, Bengal, I'm from Bangladesh, um, and Bengal, before the East India Company uh, came to um, India, was actually the richest province in India, mm. um, and it's now Bangladesh is now the poorest country, mm. one of the poorest countries um, mm. in the world. Because uh, I kind of disagree with these two gentlemen here in terms of the legacy of uh, East India Company. Um, the ladies before me just said, well, I mean, Bengal was one of the richest problems before the um, coming of East India Company, and now it's one of the poorest. And so we can see that effect. Here, you know, as opposed to how you know, the gentleman was saying that the ethics of this in the company and also where the ethics came in, uh, in terms of all the looting and stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm writing a story on uh, the tea gardens and how okay. the East India Company uh, men exploited uh, local indigenous people, yeah, yeah. looted their lands, and um, thousands of people died in the course of a yeah. uh, plantation. For sure. They, yeah. they uh, abducted people. Yeah. Uh, people died of was it, um, cholera and all other diseases. Yeah. Uh, I don't see how East India Company benefited uh, India or Bengal. I'm not saying it did. No, but they did to the other gentlemen. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but I mean, it was it actually yeah. ethics paper. Whether they stuck to the ethics is another matter, <laughs> but it was actually a written paper. 
I'm just picking up on Ahmed's point about um, the, the tea uh, plantations. You talked very interestingly, actually, I thought, about the um, museum in Kew, which I wasn't aware of, um, okay. with the indigo um, yes. exhibit. Yes, because um, so indigo was another... It was another huge... Hugely horrible thing, yeah. Uh, and I just wanted to whether the... Um, the um, um, display in that museum sets in context, or is it just all indigo came from India? It's indigo came from India. Yeah. I mean, it's an old-fashioned museum in a way. It's you know, it's got. Uh, it doesn't give you huge backstories. Right. It just tells you what the products are useful for and what happened. You know, with the, yeah. in the manufacturing process, this really. This is actually a really famous play written in Bengal um, by a Bengali playwright called Neil Dublin, which is the image of indigo, um, which right. is about the um, oppression of yeah. indigo planters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but they're all at it. I mean, the Dutch East India Company uh, just cleared an island. Fifteen thousand people were killed or, or or sent off because they wouldn't deal with them in, for mace and uh, you know. I mean, it's just horrible. I mean, empires don't exist without uh, without you know severe human rights errors. Are they? I mean, that's how every empire has ever got anywhere. I, mean, I agree with you about Hastings. He wanted to um, uh, you know, learn the Asian languages and um, was quite sympathetic in some ways to Asian culture and culture, but that was because he wanted to govern more effectively. Yes. Well, I'm not denying the econ economic exploitation. That's what they were there for. Mm -hmm. And that had a hugely negative effect. What I would defend is their skill in administration. They're, they're very skillful exploiters, I'll give you that. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> and, but so with it, they brought... Um, yeah, I mean, you'd have to be for 250 years, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd have to, yeah. Just uh, wanted to ask you something. You mentioned about uh, East India Government silk and uh, the Uruguayan silk rumors here. Yes. Now, um, I've never heard anybody making connection before you know, with uh, East India Government silk and silk weaving industry in this area. I was, when I was looking at East India Company records, every, nearly every single ship that came back brought raw silk from Bengal, right? And I was wondering what happened when they, did they export okay. them? Or did they, um, did British weavers use them? No, the happened? British weavers would have used them, yes. But nobody so far has made an action with Bengal okay. silk and silk weaving in oh, okay. Weavers. Okay, no, it's direct. Um, Spun silk would have been spun in India. Yes, I think so. Yeah. So it would come in spools, in spools, yeah. and then they. Yes, so because they, you know, they were, you know, they, India, they weren't allowed to make finish. They weren't allowed to right. make finish things in India. They were denied the industrial revolution, so that, to keep the industrial revolution healthy here. Uh, even before the Battle of Plassey, yeah. India company brought in large quantities of raw silk from Bengal. Yes. So I just wondered what happened. That was even in the um, late 1700s. You know? Yeah, well, the... 1700, uh, when, when did the Huguenots 1685. come? 1685. the Huguenots came. Yeah, and even so, after that, there were lots of so, Yeah, so they'd be here, it taking nice the cargoes. To, it would be nice to uh, see if there are any direct connection to evidence and records. <coughs> okay. Between what do you think, Charlie? Yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you said they weren't allowed the Industrial Revolution, but in fact, they must have had those weaving frames because they had... <coughs> they weren't allowed to industrialise. Yeah, that's right. But they, they were actually prevented from using the weaving frames that they had. No, because they, they, they'd import what they call pieces, which would be bits of cloth, which were the width of a loom and usually about 20 yards long or something like that. But They're like bolts. Yeah, but you I know. thought the whole point in mercantilism was that you only allowed conquered countries to produce the basic stuff, not to develop their industry. But there must have been an earlier industry in India that they just wiped out. Mm -hmm. It there sounds the reason that they must have done that. Yeah. So as they did in Egypt. I wouldn't agree with what you just said. The silk has been worn by Maharajas and even noble women and men um, ages, as far as I can remember. Yes, that's right. But so, so, back, so, so India and Bengal had to have mechanisms for making yes. silk clothes. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah, they yeah. then stopped. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Which we then stopped. No, no, we didn't. No, no, no. no, no. no, no. They, still, they still made it for the domestic market. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but for. 
Yeah. But actually, uh, there were, uh, it was called Muslim, the Muslim factory is just south of Taka. Okay. For years, like years and years, and actually uh, the British rule kind of eradicated it completely. Did they, yes, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it did happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one of Mulberry tree, uh, the Mulberry uh, tree. There is one actually in um, Bethlehem Green. Uh, is there? Uh, London Chest Hospital, what used to be London Chest Hospital. Oh, okay. It's a uh, 500 year old. Uh, oh, well, uh, check it out. It might have been, you know, James I might have dug the, oh, James, dug the hole to put it in. Yeah. <laughs> there may be a separate topic, if so, just ignore me. But I, I'm interested in how the East India, India Company was dismantled. Uh, it was dismantled by an act of parliament, I think. Right. Uh, and it was dismantled fairly fast. And, and what was the motivation for that? It was the, the, the handling of the Indian mutiny, right. which was absolutely appalling. I mean, it was, and they just, the government said, enough is enough, we're going to step in and, and take you over. The company had been a bit rickety for a while. It had lost its uh, monopoly in, uh, in 1813 uh, in India. Uh, was that the first, first current moment? And then China as well. So it, it had been coming, you know, been losing ground a bit. Um, and uh, there were, you know, America was uh, gaining ground, the world trade was, you know, happening, and it wasn't as important as it had been. Um, but uh, uh, no, I think it just, it, it, it was a fairly short and sharp, I think. And they just. Uh, Sold off the house. Just yeah. for information, one of the young authors who participated in the project, he looked at how East India Company assets were dispersed mm -hmm. after its liquidation. Oh, okay. So oh, good. Okay. In, in the classic book. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Good. 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 I, I just I I found um, that Clive set you such an embarrassment standing at the entrance to um, Number Ten Downing Street. And I'm so <laughs> interested that it was put up. Um, what was it, 1903? Is there any movement to have it removed? Because not that I know of. It no. It's extraordinary, and children are still christened Clive all the time. <coughs> yes. It, it, to me, it's extraordinary the, the sort of absolute ignorance of us all. Yes. Of what actually these things? And I believe Havelock wasn't he involved in the 1857. He certainly was. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, he had all those people shot out of cannons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But sorry, I'm just um, wondering what well, you're sitting here. Well, after we leave here tonight, we can go and pour paint all over him, can't we? After we leave here tonight, we can. Yeah, or plant grass on it or something. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. 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 Get the crane. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. One of the ones called Mansions had uh, the, Royal, uh, the Royal Pavilion Brighton. Oh, that was only because um, uh, next door to... Uh, um, uh, Dalesford, uh, a Bengal army officer moved in next door to Dalesford and had his house built in Mughal style by uh, Samuel Pepys Cockrell, who was the uh, Indian uh, East India House uh, uh, architect. And he had it built in Mughal style, and it was called Sezin Court. And you can see that today, you can, you can go and visit it. Um, and when the Prince Regent visited Sezincourt, he was so excited about it that he asked Nash to build the Brighton Pavilion in a similar way. And then the other one, you mentioned something about the Stranger's House for Sailors, which was built. Yes. Um, so is that still the No. There is, there is one big mission still in, down Commercial Road, uh, but that, uh, that didn't last, the Stranger's House. Um, there, if you go down Commercial Road, it's quite an interesting road. It doesn't take too long to walk to the East India Dock from here. Uh, and there are lots of... On the, on the way, you can see old mission houses, and you just... an old, you know, warehouse, and you do get a feel of what it... you know, what has been here before. Hmm. You, you, you touched on the significance of, of the company to the growth of London as a trading hub and the institutions. I just wanted you to expand on that a little bit more about... House. And it's quite interesting because, of course, now it's forgotten. Yes. It's well, global evidence it, some if you the rest of it's forgotten. Yeah. Embarrassed. Yeah. But if you go back, if you look at, you know, lots of Lord Mayors were directors of the company. Lots of, um, lots of guild uh, people running guilds were directors of companies. They all had their fingers in the pie. 
Um, and the, so the money was coming in. Um, and uh, even John Evelyn, who was just said something about Wanstead House, and he had 500 quid worth of shares in the East India Company. Um, so everybody, you know, it, it have, and London must have got rich because of it. Mm. I mean, it must have, somebody, um, was it on the Huguenot Walk? I was told that um, uh, London was the only capital that could have taken so many Huguenots at the time because it was the only capital of any size in Europe at that moment. And one reason it was that size must have been its wealth. And its wealth has to have been based in some not small part on the East India Company. Um, so I do, I don't, um, Nick Robbins, who gave a talk last year, uh, is very good on finance, uh, and his book called The Company, the, company that, the Corporation That Changed the World, yeah, um, is really worth reading, because he says, he described it rather uh, succinctly as being a, uh, bigger than Walmart, more corrupt than Enron, <laughs> and uh, did more damage than Union Carbide. <laughs> so uh, it gives you a sort of very quick idea of uh, uh, an overview. But it was a little bit more subtle than that, I think, probably. <laughs> but it's, it's hard to know. I mean, if you, if you think something's completely ruined your country, I don't know how you climb out of that, really. Anyway... Um, uh, these are the maps here, if anyone's vaguely interested. Any other questions? Yeah, well, were the Mercers very strong in Yeah, yeah, they all were, yeah, yeah, they all were. Because they did silk and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, um, uh, the Mercers came out of the Grocers, I think. Mercers and Grocers, because Grocer means gross, like weight, gross, and they, and they were involved in spices and things originally, and, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I don't think I've been to the Mercer's Hall, have you been well, there? It's just, a, well, obviously, Dick Whittington was a Mercer, we're going back to the Yeah, it's a bit early for the company, mm. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, I'm, I just think they, they're all, all involved, you know, and you find people like Thomas Smythe, you know, he had fingers in so many pies. Well, as today, you know, if you're a director of one company, one bank, you've probably got a few other irons in the fire. So what do you think, um, you know, there's these museums in Amsterdam and Sweden, because presumably they were no less exploitative no. in Amsterdam and Sweden than um, the English East India Company. And, and they're quite proud of, you know, they fly their flags, yes. you know. Uh, which which wouldn't happen here, um, possibly because they uh, failed a bit earlier than the East India Company. Um, the Dutch East, like yes, right. the Dutch East India Company. Um, it's VOC, its initials, and there's another way of saying de it it died by corruption uh, with the VOC. Um, yeah, I think it's a bit further back in history, and I think. I don't know, they've got, but they've got their own heroes. There's a guy called Cohen um, who's um, got a statue in his hometown, VOC man, but he was responsible for all kinds of massacres. Um, but I don't, I don't know if you do pull down statues, uh, how often you have to do it in history, really. I mean, <laughs> 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 Richard, Richard Cardinal and Cromwell outside. Yeah. Them, but they both had other reasons than just, um, you know... Well, Cromwell's, but Cromwell had his head stuck on a spike outside Parliament as well, didn't he? So <laughs> it's kind of... Uh, it comes and goes, doesn't it? No, it's just that particular place. Uh, you know, when you're taking visitors up, up there is 10 Downing Street. Yeah. And you don't want to admit that the uh, figure who's in the way looking all heroic uh, yeah. is this dreadful villain. Yeah. But the centre of Colcassa is the Victorian Memorial Hall. With Queen Victoria sat at the front there, they, they're not in the least embarrassed by that. <laughs> mm. Because here, yeah, they as part of the the story. Mm. But I mean, I kind of never would never No, no. It's generally better to put up stat other statues that tell the other story. Well, and take their own. Oh yeah, well that could be a way of doing it, couldn't it? Yes. Yeah.
Because actually, it's, you know, it's if you just go with an old history. Yeah. So we have Gandhi the other end. We have a monument that says something else about that. Gandhi, that's square. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, something that says... Yeah. Because that study, uh, statue of um, Hastings that ended up in um, Calcutta, it actually um, has, um, I think, a, a Muslim munshi on one side, yes. kind of looking up very respectfully at him, and a Brahmin on the other. Yeah. But obviously, the context of history has changed there. People don't look at that the same way now in 21st century Calcutta um, as the Europeans would have looked at it in sure. 19th century yeah. um, England when it was first created. Yeah. I think, um, there should be a statue of Sergio Dollar. Yes. Because uh, that's, if anything, more than Gandhi, because Sridhar uh, Dhala was the uh, guy that actually fought Robert Klein, but mm -hmm. actually... But he was a foolish man to challenge Gerard Zayed. This after coming to power, and he didn't have any, any strong support base within his own community. That's a different case. He delivered Bengal to 50 new companies, but he's foolish. Well, that's my question. <laughs> 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 well, maybe, you, yeah, you know... Get, get some statues up. Start, start a whip round, start a crowdfunding. <laughs> Did you find anything about how we compared with the French? Or the well, we kind of fought a, uh, we fought a sort of proxy war with the French, yeah. didn't we? Because Plassey was doing the Seven Years' War uh, with France, uh, and that's when we... Uh, when Plassey was taken by Clive, but it's also when General Wolfe took Canada... Oh, yeah. for, for the English from the French so we were fighting the French on foreign battlefields as it were you know um, and Tipu Sultan was overthrown because the French arrived too late to help him um, and then in the uh, war of independence uh, sorry the uh, Napoleonic wars um, when uh, uh, when Charles Wellesley was there uh, that again that was uh, the English fighting the French um, and because we just lost the colonies uh, of America, there were all these spare soldiers around. Yeah. So we sent them off to India, you know, to help the company. Um, yeah, so it was, um, it's all power politics, really. Good. <laughs>